We left off, which was with the Wanderer, and it's right around pages 75 to 80. Sorry, lines, 75 to 80. The Wanderer says that if you want a good reputation, or if you want a good saying after your death, that before you must go on your way, before he must be on his way, he act bravely on earth against the enemy's malice. This is line 75 now. Do bold deeds to beat the devil. So the sons of men will salute him afterwards and his praise thereafter live with the angels forever and ever in the joy of eternal life to light among heaven's hosts. And I discussed on what day is today? Today's Tuesday? On Thursday. I discussed on Thursday that, you know, it seems like that would be a natural good ending point for the poem. But the poet disagrees. The days are lost, and all the pomp of this earthly kingdom. Okay. There are now neither kings nor emperors, and the word that's used for emperors is Caesars, I believe I pointed out, nor gold givers as there once were when they did the greatest glorious deeds, lived in most lordly fame. All this noble host has fallen. All this noble host kind of means all those great heroes of old. All those great warriors. All those great people we've heard stories about. They're all gone. Their happiness lost. And who remains? The weaker ones. Remain and rule the world. Laboring and toiling. Joy is laid low. The earth's nobility grows old and withers like every man throughout this Middle Earth, or throughout Middle Earth. Notice, the nobility grows old and withers like everyone else. Our poet is kind of equating there. The haves and the have-nots. Guess what? As Hamlet will say, Shakespeare's Hamlet, we all die the same. We all end up clay. So... Old age overtakes him, his face grows pale, the gray beard grieves, he knows his old friends, offspring of princes, have been given up to the earth. That is, the person who kind of thinks about all this. When his life fails him, the, his fleshly cloak, his body, will neither taste the sweet, nor touch the sore, nor move a hand, nor think with his mind. What's the speaker emphasizing? What's the speaker moving towards? What's the speaker moving towards with those lines? When his life fails him, his fleshly cloak will neither taste the sweet, nor touch the sore, nor move a hand, nor think with his mind. Yeah. Or even more simply. When you're dead, you're dead. That's it. There's, there's, there's nothing else. Okay? And what he says following is what really emphasizes that. Though a brother may wish to strew his brother's grave with gold. That is, put a bunch of treasure in that burial with him. Bury him among the dead with heaps of treasure to take with him. That gold will be useless. Before the terror of God for any soul that is full of sin, the gold he had hidden while here on earth. Now, why would the poet mention burying a brother with a bunch of treasure? That was like a send off, wasn't it? Like a send off? Because it mentions that like you bury them with those you don't want them to have enough. Yeah, I mean, that's what anthropologists tell us. Yeah. Anthropologists tell us grave goods are all for the person to use in their afterlife. Right? Not knocking anthropologists. Well, I am a little bit, but <laughs> not a lot. Seems to me, a little bit anthropology, that even the people who died 5,000 BC, who buried loved ones with treasure, seems to me even they knew. You put them in the ground, and... The body and what you put in the ground pretty much stays there. Now, if there's something else beyond just the body, 
maybe that doesn't stay there. Okay? That is, maybe the stuff you put in the ground, other than the body, is more symbolic. Not literal to be used in the afterlife. But notice what our speaker is saying. Okay, this speaker, first of all, the way, not pagan. This person's thoroughly Christian. If he hasn't made it clear already, it should be clear already. Okay? So, though a brother may wish to strew his brother's grave with gold, bury him with a lot of treasure. Notice the speaker says, 100. That gold will be useless before God. In other words, you know, you could bury a loved one with all kinds of treasure, thinking that's going to help him. But, you know, when the soul comes before God, it's not like, here, God, here's a bunch of money. As, uh, as the character of the misfit says in Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find. Um, how, how does the character, how does the misfit put it? The undertaker never did take any tip. Why? Because dead men don't tip. In other words, the undertaker takes what? Everything. He's, he's implying there that undertakers are, are a little bit unscrupulous. You send a body to an undertaker, to a mortician, a mortuary, and what does that undertaker do? Just, just lay the body all out nicely in a coffin and everything. Pulls out fillings, takes off watches, you know, rings, anything that's valuable, right? That gold will be useless before the terror of God for any soul that is full of sin. What's the full of sin? The gold he had hidden while here on earth. Who had hidden? The brother that is strewing the grave with gold or the brother that's dead? Yeah. Notice what the speaker is saying is the purpose of gold. Is it to be hidden? Is it to be buried? If it's not to be hidden, it's not to be buried. What are you supposed to do with it? Give it away. Give it away, possibly. Use it. Okay. I had a former student, teaches at Fisk now, did her doctoral dissertation on the Exeter book, Elegies. Okay. Primarily the Elegies, but other, other works in the Exeter book also. And her, her whole argument is that the Exeter book is largely about the giving of alms and how the giving of alms is a virtue for kings. It is something kings are supposed to do. They're not supposed to take and amass treasure. They're supposed to distribute it. And in all Anglo-Saxon literature, one of the characteristics of a good king is a king who gives treasure. Not only in that reciprocal exchange of, I'm going to go fight a war for you, you give me treasure, but even just out of the quote-unquote goodness of his heart, giving treasure out. All right? Turn the page. Great is the terror of God before which the earth trembles. Now that kind of harkens back to... Gold will be useless before the terror of God for any soul full of sin. Great is the terror of God before which the earth trembles. So if the earth trembles, imagine what a soul is going to do. He established the sturdy foundations. That is, the world. The sturdy foundations are like the pillars, you know, that support the earth. The earth's solid surface and the high heavens. Foolish is he who dreads not the Lord. Why? The fool is the one who said in his heart, according to the psalmist and the book of Proverbs, there is no God. Our writer, whoever the writer is, is kind of channeling some biblical ideas. Foolish is he who dreads not the Lord, death will find him unprepared. Why will he be unprepared? Okay, why else? Yeah, he will be full of sin. What will the sin be? If he dreads, when the speaker says, 
Or the writer says, he dreads not the Lord. What does he really mean? Don't believe in God. Don't need to worry about God. God doesn't exist. God isn't real. From the speaker's perspective, hello. <laughs> when you die, eyes open. Notice. He will, death will find him unprepared. Not he will find death unprepared. Notice who the agent is. Death. Death will come looking, which is, you know, kind of equivalent or similar to, if you're familiar with it, Emily Dickinson's. Because I could not stop for death. Anybody know the next line? He stopped for me. I was too busy. I've got too much stuff on my plate. My life's too full. I can't, I can't die now. Blessed is he. So foolish is he who doesn't dread the Lord. Why? He's going to die unprepared. Blessed is he who lives humbly. Mercy from heaven comes to him. Notice the opposition. Foolish, if you don't dread God. Blessed if you're humble. Because if you're humble, it implies what? One thing it implies, I don't know everything. Because the person that says, there is no God, is asserting what? I know everything. Okay? Humility is like, well, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Blessed is he who lives humbly. Mercy from heaven comes to him. That is, is given to him. Kind of like at the beginning of the wanderer. Okay? The one, the solitary one, what? Longs for, experiences, expects, awaits mercy, the favor of God, etc., etc. So, mercy from heaven comes to him. The maker strengthens his spirit, the one who lives humbly. Why? For he, the one who lives humbly, Believes in his, God's, might. What is, mean, what is meant by might? Is this, you know, the heavenly host, the, all the angels with their swords and weapons, that might? God's military might? I don't think so. It's his power. Not thundering from above, but his ability to do things. A man must steer a strong mind and keep it stable. <laughs> What's meant by a strong mind? You've heard of somebody who is a worker. Louder? Like they're too lazy to make up any kind of behavior. Okay. Could be that. Is a strong mind having conviction? How is having conviction different from this? Phrase. If you've ever heard that, that's what I'm saying. Stubborn. stubborn, arrogant, right? hard-headed. Hard a man must steer a strong mind. Steer. What does that imply? Control. Control. If you think of that strong mind as being like a ship, what does that ship need? What does every boat really need? Captain, what does the captain do? How? With a rudder. Turns the helm, turns the wheel. The helm, the wheel is connected to what? It's connected to the rudder. Notice, big old massive ship. Little tiny rudder. It doesn't take much to steer that ship. But if it's not steered, chaos ensues. A strong mind, okay, needs a rudder, in other words. To do what? Keep it stable. What's the opposite of stable? Unstable. Thank you. <laughs> Without using un. <laughs> Different word. Chaos. 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 Steadfast in its promises, pure in its ways. Steadfast. What does it mean to be steadfast? Not a word we use very often. Consistent. Consistent. Consistent in its promises. Now, I think 
what the speaker is talking about is not merely the uttering of promises, what comes with every promise. You get married. Maybe you have vows. Maybe you don't. I don't care. <laughs> Let's assume you're an old traditional fuddy duddy like I am, and you utter vows. Is that what's all important? Upholding. Upholding them. That is word, deed, action. So steadfast in its promises is fulfilling those promises, keeping to those promises. Pure in its ways. Every man must hold in moderation. His love for a friend, his hatred for a foe. Well, why should you hold in moderation love for a friend? Why can't you go just all out? I mean, <laughs> go full board, totally love for a friend. Go back to the wanderer. Here? Okay, it could be idolizing. What happens when you idolize something? What happens when you, as some of my students write, put a person on a pedal stool? <laughs> stool with pedals. Whenever that gets knocked down, like they just completely lose their identity. If they get knocked off that pedal stool, <laughs> what happens to them in your mind? They're less. They're diminished. They're diminished. They're less than. That is the. Use where you would use the idol you created of that person is now fallen. Okay, that's possibly what's meant. So, realistic expectation of somebody that you idolize that would fall. Yeah, because what happens to everybody you idolize like that? What do they show you? Is it that they fall? They're it human. might be they're, they're human. human. You know, I'll go out on a limb here. One of the stupidest lines ever uttered in all of Hollywood history. You complete me. From Jerry Maguire. Great. Why is that one of the stupidest lines, possibly? Maybe you don't think it is, and that's fine. Okay. That's one possibility. Way over the top. What else? By saying you complete me, what's what's the speaker saying? You are not complete. I am incomplete. I am unfulfilled. I am unhappy without you. Now, I've been married almost 33 years. I'm not going to be the one to say, you know, I am incomplete and unhappy, etc., without my wife, or that I am complete or totally happy. Why? Because if you try to find quote unquote happiness in an individual person, what is that person inevitably going to do? It's like the ring with Frodo, you know? <laughs> Any mortal who tries to possess the ring will be overcome. Anybody who places all their eggs in that basket called somebody else, that person's going to what? They're going to trip. And those eggs, <laughs> they're all going to break. Marriage is the one true thing. So where do you find, quote-unquote, true happiness and such? Well, this poet is going to say one place, but it's God. That's what this poet is going to say. But I think the poet is also saying, as the wanderer poet said, you can't find it here. Okay, Both these poets are saying that. It's not to be found necessarily here. Here, in a person, or go back to the wanderer, wealth, or here, gold. Okay. So, you must hold in moderation his love for a friend. Notice we've only done the first half of that line. Mm -hmm. And his hatred for a foe. But I thought, you know, in good, I was going to say American fashion, but I'll go farther back. In good Indo-European fashion, you know, if you have an enemy, I mean a real enemy, you're just supposed to hate that person. I mean just demonize, dehumanize. Why? Lord of the Rings reference again. Gandalf and Frodo are talking about Gollum. 
And Frodo says about Gollum, he is just an enemy. He deserves death. Notice, why does he deserve death? Because of the statement that came before. He's just an enemy. What does the word just mean? That is the totality of Gollum's being for Frodo. Because an enemy, an enemy's a target. What is every target meant for? You shoot it. <laughs> you destroy it. That's it. Anything that has a bullseye means hit. Gollum is a bullseye in Frodo's mentality. Okay? But this speaker says, hmm, you should hold in moderation your hatred for a foe. Though he may wish him full of fire. And yeah, that's probably Christian hell, damnation, you know. Burn in hell, etc., etc. And then the manuscript's damaged. There's something missing. We don't know where the speaker was going after that. Or his friend consumed on a funeral pyre. Again, we don't know what the beginning of that line is. Something's missing. Fate is greater, the maker mightier than any man's thoughts. Now, is the speaker equating fate with God? I don't think so. Because the maker comes after fate. Fate is greater than any man's thoughts. The maker mightier than any man's thoughts. One of the classic definitions of God, St. Anselm of Canterbury, I think it was, said, that beyond which cannot be thought. You can't think of anything higher, greater, etc. than God. Fate's kind of a little bit beneath that. Okay? St. Anselm of Canterbury, I believe. So, having said all that, notice what the speaker says. So let's think about where we should have our home. Not where we do have our home. Should. Where do we want to... Remember the other day I had up here, I said, you know, home. What is home? And you guys said a whole bunch of words, you know. It's where you could be yourself. It's where you're loved. It's where you're accepted, et cetera, et cetera. Where should we have our home? And then think, how do you get there? Well, what has the speaker said? The speaker goes out on these journeys on the ocean for to seek out a foreign land and a foreign lord. Foreign, I'm going to leave England and go to Germany. I'm going to leave England and go to uh, Ireland. I'm going to leave England and go to Iceland. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. This is Voyage of St. Brendan. This is leaving Middle Earth, going off to Valinor. This is the last great, huge pilgrimage. This is, you know, John Bunyan in the 17th century describe it as going to the celestial city in his allegory, um, Pilgrim's Progress. Let us consider where we should have our home and then how we might come there. So, if you think about where your home is, where you think your home should be, what obviously do you have to do? Say you don't want to live in Murfreesboro the rest of your life. A couple of my kids who are in their 20s just can't wait till they're done with their quote-unquote Professional school so they can get the hell out of there. Okay? It's because they've been to too many big cities like London and Prague and you know, Melbourne, Australia and places like that. So, say you don't want to live in Murfreesboro the rest of your life and you want to ultimately settle down in, I don't know, Paris. What do you do between now and settling down in Paris? Learn French. Can learn French, <laughs> though they speak English. They don't like to. <laughs> they do. I heard somebody have money. How do you have money? I wish I could just have money. I could just walk out there and money. You save it. You how do you save it? You work for it, unless you have nefarious ways of you know dealing for it or robbing banks or you know. But even that's work. Printing it. <laughs> okay. In other words. You got to do what? A whole bunch of steps. Okay? That's what he means. Think how we might come there. Plan how to come there. Well, that takes us back to 
death will find him unprepared. If we're going to think about where we should have our homeland, and that homeland is, from the speaker's perspective, heaven, then what do you have to do? How do you get to heaven? you got to think about that question. Is it possibly putting a bunch of gold in your tomb? Or let's maybe extrapolate a little bit. Maybe he doesn't mean literally putting gold in the tomb. Maybe he means making a big fat donation to the church. Can you buy God? Can you buy entrance into heaven? Later Middle Ages thought you could. We'll talk when we get to Chaucer. Okay? Or later on, the early Renaissance. How, you know, the whole Protestant Reformation began because of a guy selling what are called indulgences. Okay? Had a little song. When coins in the coffer clink, another soul from purgatory springs. So, put money in the coffer to help buy a dead ancestor time out of purgatory. <laughs> Be nice if it worked that way. Let us sow and let us strive to reach that place of eternal peace, unending blessedness. What's that place? Our home. Where life is found in the love of the Lord, hope in heaven. Notice how he describes heaven. Eternal peace, unending blessedness, life, love, hope. Okay? So describe eternal peace, unending blessedness, life, love, and hope. Does that sound like the modern, you know, Popular, maybe somewhat antagonistic to Christianity conception of everybody just sitting up on their little cloud with the little harp going, Praise Jesus. You know, <laughs> while the sinners are down in hell having a weenie roast, you know, and having a lot of fun, throwing a kanger, etc. <laughs> no. How is the, the speaker really described it? Well, it's kind of the language from. The book of Revelation. How's it all end? If you've never read the book of Revelation, read it. Forget all the prophecy kind of stuff. It ends with what's called the wedding feast of the Lamb. It's a party. Okay? This speaker is writing from a Christian perspective, but the speaker is also writing from a somewhat Anglo-Saxon perspective. Where was the center of the Anglo-Saxon community? The hall. The hall. What happened in the hall? Parties. We saw that with Cadman, right? He was in a monastery. And they're sitting there having yabarashippa, as it actually says in the Old English. Beership. Like fellowship, friendship, <laughs> beership. Of a standard <laughs> pertaining to beer. In the monastery. And the harp is coming around. Why? You get a bunch of monks. They drink a bunch of ale. Their lips get a little loose. And they start singing songs. In fact, we have a letter. I don't have time to go into this, but I will. We have a letter from Alcuin of York. I've mentioned his name before. He was the one that Charlemagne hired to be the headmaster at his cathedral school in Aachen. Okay? to teach Charlemagne's children and the children of the royals, the nobility and such. Well, Alcuin wrote a letter from Germany to another abbot okay, in England. And he asked in that letter, Latin, Quid hienaldis cum Christo, which means, what, I'll throw in a little English, the hell, <laughs> does Ingeld have to do with Christ? Well, who is Ingeld? He's a pagan Germanic hero. We're going to see him in Beowulf. 
What does Ingel, this pagan Germanic hero, have to do with Christ? Why does he write the letter and ask the question? Because word has reached him that in the monastery, at the refectory, that is at the meals, in the refectory, they're not reading Lives of the Saints during the meal. They're not reading homilies. That is, everybody eats, and one person will eat a little bit later because that person will stand up at a lecture and read. Everybody else is silent. This is, you know, part of the spiritual edification. You get taught while you're eating. Instead, somebody is standing up there and singing, you know, the 70s hits, as it were. It's just that the 670s and 570s rather than the 1970s. They're singing pagan, Germanic, heroic stories. And he's like, no, 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 no. Ingel doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. J.R.R. Tolkien disagreed. <laughs> totally, by the way, which we can go into in another time. So, heaven is portrayed as kind of a Anglo-Saxon <laughs> hall feasting. What's the difference? This one won't burn down. This one ends, notice by the way, the last word, hope in because what do all the Germanic halls ultimately end in? Football. Despair. If you think of the Germanic halls as being represented by Germanic mythology, Ragnarok. Okay. Thanks be to the Holy One that he has so honored us, us who, us who seek our home in heaven, because there are some who don't, like, like the Foolish one who doesn't dread the Lord, because, oh, is he going to be surprised. <laughs> Thanks be to the Holy One that he has so honored us, ruler of heaven, eternal Lord, throughout all time. And all God's people said, <laughs> amen. That's why the amen is there. What does amen really mean? So yes, so be it. You know, that's the seafarer. That's one of those two elegies, the other one the wanderer. From the Exeter book. Okay? So, now we move to Dream of the Root. A root is a cross. Okay? This poem is an example of prosopo pros. Prosopo, too many O's in this stupid word. Prosopopia, okay? Which means an inanimate object speaks. There are a few examples of this in Old English literature. Um, where in another poem, a piece of wood speaks. Okay, this one, this speaks. Or the cross speaks, okay? The poem survives in the Vercelli manuscript. It's one of those four great codices that I mentioned, you know, which is dated sometime approximately 975 to 1025. That is, it was written, copied in that time frame, right? But there are portions of the poem, and I usually try to uh, put this up on the screen, but Portions of the poem are survive in a big stone cross called, it's called, spelled, Ruthwell, but it's pronounced Rivel, like drivel without the D. Rivel, okay? The Rivel Cross, which is in Dumfries, Scotland. I think it currently stands, it's like 18 feet tall. Part of it's missing. It was thrown down, we believe, knocked down um, during the reign of Henry VIII. We'll talk about Henry VIII and why he deserves this place in hell um, <laughs> later. <clears throat> um, so it was knocked down and just 
worn away by the elements, partially. Now it's inside a chapel. In the 18th century, they stood it back up. They realized there's a part missing. They put a false piece in it, okay? And then they built a building around it because they realized this sucker's really old. How old? It probably dates from the early 7th century. 7th to early 8th centuries. Roughly, most people kind of date it, roughly 725. Okay? But again, it's got part of the poem inscribed on it. In Anglo-Saxon runes. Okay? This is, this is kind of late period usage for runes. It also has a Latin inscription. And it also has images of the life of Christ. It's got Christ with Mary Magdalene. It's got Christ on the cross with, with um, John the Apostle and, and Mary, Jesus' mother, at his feet. Things like that. Right? So that's background. Turn to page 72, 73. You got a picture of the rebel cross there. Part of it, at least. I think it's 18 feet at the top. I've got two numbers for some reason. I've got 18 and 24. Um, but again, there's a portion that's that's um, missing. For example, the cross piece that's that's currently there. I don't think that's part of the original. I think that's a reproduction of what they think it looked like. Okay? It's not the only cross like this, by the way. There's another one called the Bew Castle Cross. Okay? That's more complete. It was also set up outside. The Celtic Christians set crosses up on a variety of places. Usually, from what we know, usually on sites that had been quote unquote holy to pagan Celts. See, when the, when the Roman Christians came um, in 597, one of the things that Pope Gregory told Augustine to do was when he, when he found out, you know, they've got a lot of quote-unquote holy places. He said, cool, that's good. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to go into where those holy places are. Might be streams, might be springs, might be ponds, might be groves of trees. You're going to go in there with holy water and incense, and you're going to exorcise the bad spirits out of them, and then you're going to baptize them. So you're going to bring those holy places into Christianity, and we will make them essentially shrines okay, to Christian saints. Sometimes the shrines to Christian saints were because some Christian had been killed there, okay, but it was still a, more or less a pagan site, so we're going to make them shrines to Christian places, etc., etc. Okay? Dream of the Root begins with what? Not the pronunciation. What? Modern English, what? Now, is that a question? Is he going, what? 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 What do you want? Why are you bothering me? Okay, I'll see. <laughs> Is it that? No. Usually it gets translated something like, lo, or behold. There's actually, um, one guy did a translation of a bunch of old English stuff, and there are three or four poems that begin this way, and it began it with, yo! <laughs> Why? It's that one syllable sound, or... Somebody standing up with a glass of crystal and ding, 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 getting everybody's attention. It kind of means the performance is getting ready. Everybody, you know, take your seats, get your beer, quit fighting, you know, etc. So, listen. It doesn't say listen in the original. It says what? I will speak of the sweetest dream what came to me in the middle of the night when speech bearers slept in their rest. Okay? Notice. The dream came to me. So if the dream came to me, where did it come from? 
Emma's pointing up. <laughs> God. Possibly. Where else? Where did it not come from? Himself. Himself. Now, is that simply because he's just a dumb Anglo-Saxon and he doesn't understand anything about dream psychology? Maybe. Or maybe it's more profound than that, and maybe the speaker is saying, where do dreams really come from? Are, do they come from within? I mean, Ebenezer Scrooge ascribes his first visitor, Jacob Marley, to what? Maybe you're a piece of undigested beef or potato. And Jacob Marley rattles his chain. He goes, sorry, okay, you're here. <laughs> I get it. Real. All right. Where do ideas come from? Do you think up ideas? That is, do you sit there and go, <laughs> paper? <laughs> How did J.K. Rowling get the idea for Harry Potter? How did J.R. Tolkien get the idea for The Hobbit? Well, J.K. Rowling was on a train from Manchester to London, and at one moment in time, she was just a unwed mother living on the dole, on um, welfare, essentially. And five minutes later, she was still an unwed mother living on the dole, but she had an idea. At an instant in time, she, the light bulb went off, and she thought about a boy who discovers on his 11th birthday that his parents were murdered by the greatest dark wizard who ever lived, and that dark wizard is after him. Why did that idea come to her? And not to Emma. I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, believe me. I'm teaching the damn books for nearly 20 years, and I keep, you know, why her and not me? Was, is it, was there something in the air that the train went through and it stuck with her? Is that how the ideas work? J.K. Uh, J.R. Tolkien, marking entrance exams to Oxford. One summer morning, 1931, he turns a page of a blue book. There's a blank page, and a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. He didn't have the foggiest idea of what a hobbit was. But the idea stuck with him, and he started creating a story, telling the story to his kids, reading it to his friends, and it becomes, you know, The Lord of the Rings, it becomes Peter Jackson's Abomination, it becomes, you know, a whole bunch of other stuff. So, notice, this stuff comes from outside, the speaker says. When speech bearers slept in their rest. Speech bearers. The old English word there is rared, bearend. Rared, like record, bearers. It's a kinning. But he hasn't translated it. Or he has, but he's translated it extremely literally. I often have st students go, what does he mean by speech bearer? Well, who bears speech? <laughs> we do. <laughs> this isn't a cow sitting out there and, and suddenly, ooh, you know. <laughs> it's when humans are at rest. So, this individual's alone, notice. He's not with other speech bearers. When speech bearers slept in their rest, it seemed, what does seem always mean? Uncertainty. Really close, Megan. I mean, yes, to, to, to some extent. It always implies a condition contrary to fact. That is, maybe, maybe not. If something seems too good to be true, it usually is. That email I just got the other day from some guy saying, oh yeah, I, blah, 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 and I have $16.2 million in a bank. Send me your details and I will. Sure. You know. <laughs> It seemed that I saw a most wondrous tree raised on high, wound round with light. The brightest of beams. He's not talking about a literal tree. This isn't one of the, Tolkien nerd here, one of the trees of Valinor. This isn't a giant majestic redwood. This is a cross. 
It's a beam, okay? Wound with light. Like light strips <laughs> just shining all over this thing. The brightest of beams. All that beacon was covered in gold. Notice, seam, 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 seam. Covered in gold. So it's not, it's not just a, a cross. It's a cross that's been gold-plated. All that beacon was covered in gold. Gems, gems. gems stood fair at the earth's corners. And there were five up on the cross beam. Well, where are the earth's corners? North, south, east, west. So why are there gems standing at the earth's corners? They're at the earth's corners from the perspective of the speaker. Where's the speaker? I don't mean where geographically. I mean physically, how is he located on the world? Possibly. Well, wherever you are is the center, right? I mean, think about it. Wherever you are, that is the center for you. He's lying down. He's lying down. Why? Because he's dreaming. And some people do. I mean, a lot of my classes, I can tell the people aren't there. They're, they're dreaming, right? He's lying down. So how does he see the gems at the four corners? Foot of the cross, at the horizon at his feet. Head of the cross, at the horizon that way. One arm of the cross, at the horizon that way. What? This is a stinking big cross. It divides the whole sky. It's not like he just suddenly sees a six foot or ten foot or twenty foot cross hovering off in the distance. Monty Python ish, you know. No, this cross stretches, it spans the entire world. And at that arm where it touches the earth over there, kind of like a rainbow, what is supposed to be at the foot of every rainbow? Pot of gold. Pot of gold. What's he see? Gems. Why? What kind of gems? Well, within the Christian tradition, what happened on the cross? Christ died. God died. And what happened? Put a nail through your hand. And what's going to happen? Or through your wrist? It's going to bleed. That's the gem. So you have blood there, blood there. Blood there, blood there. But, again, within the Christian tradition, that blood is what? Is it just blood? Precious. It's precious. Okay. Jim stood fair at the earth's corners, and there were five up on the cross beam. Okay. So you have this part, and here's this part. All the angels of the Lord looked on fair throughout, through all eternity. Difficult passage. We're not going to go into the, you know, what the old English read and such. That was no felon's gallows. But that's what crosses were. Crosses were for felons, for criminals. But Holy Spirit beheld him there, men over the earth, and all this glorious creation. Now, we're not sure if the Holy Spirits are referring to men over the earth or angels. Christ is on the cross, Holy Spirits, angels, or maybe the righteous dead, men over the earth, and notice, all creation. Wondrous was the victory tree, and I was stained by victory tree. What kind of victory? Over sin. Victory over sin, victory over death and hell, victory over Satan. Uh, but leave the... the Dream aside for a moment and go back to the event it commemorates Christ hanging on the cross. How many people standing at the foot of the cross go, yeah, way to go. Be victorious. You showed Pilate man. Or you showed the high priest. No, because, eh, you know. Wondrous was the victory tree, and I was stained by sins. Stained. What does stain imply? Doesn't come out? Really? You guys need to get a different detergent, man. I mean, 
dirtied. Stained implies, you know, should be what? Clean. But my sins, they dirtied me. Wounded with guilt. Well, what else is stained and wounded? Right here. How about the tree? It's got blood dripping on it. It's had what pounded into it? Nails. Nails. I saw the tree of glory honored in garments, shining with joys, bedecked with gold. Go to, particularly, somewhere like a Roman Catholic or an Orthodox cathedral. Don't go to your typical evangelical, you know, church. Why? Because they don't use much gold. I mean, if they do have gold, it's on the guitars and, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> go to a traditional cathedral and you'll see gold chalices. You'll see gold lampstands. Why? What's the gold for? What's the purpose? We talked about this with, um, earlier I think it was with Ken when we were talking a little bit about the Viking invasion and such. Yeah, it's to show the worth of what's, you know, there. So, he saw the cross shining with joys, bedecked with gold. So the cross is covered with gold now. Jim said covered worthily the creator's tree. Now, this poet would have been familiar, more than likely, with all kinds of everyday, ordinary, in his experience, crosses at churches that were covered in gold and had rubies and topazes and garnets and stuff just encrusted on there. Okay? And yet beneath the gold, I began to see an ancient wretched struggle when it first began to bleed on the right side. Line 19a, an ancient wretched struggle. This is a, an oft debated passage. What's the ancient wretched struggle? Is it Christ on the cross? Or does it go back a little bit farther? Is the ancient wretched struggle Adam in the garden? Because after all, the cross wouldn't have been necessary unless Adam, if Adam, Adam and Eve hadn't done what happened. An ancient wretched struggle when it first began to bleed on the right side. Why is the cross bleeding on the right side? That's where Christ had his side pierced by the Roman centurion. I was all beset with sorrows, fearful for that fair vision. He's thinking, why, why, why me, God? <laughs> Why did this dream come to me? I saw that eager beacon change garments and colors. So, what? The cross, you know, says, close your eyes for a moment. Changes garments and says, here I am, back again. What does that mean, changes garments? Go to, you know, buy a, I think lottery tickets have this, or some cards and stuff. Hologram, you know, you hold it one way and look at it, it's one image, you turn it slightly and it's something else. What's happening with the cross? At times he sees it covered with gold and gems, and other times he sees it what? Literally covered, Literally covered with blood. I mean, a Mel Gibson kind of cross, if you're familiar with Passion of the Christ. I mean, it's not just a little, it's like blood oozing out of the pores of the wood. Now it was drenched, now bedecked with treasure. And yet, lying there a long while, I beheld in sorrow the Savior's tree until I heard it utter a sound. So we're not told how long, but it was a while. It's probably not five minutes. It's probably like he's sitting there going, what does this mean? And then the tree speaks. It was so long ago, I remember it still, that I was felled from the forest edge, ripped up from my roots. Let's assume the speaker is 700. That is, this is occurring in the year 700. Should the tree sound like this? It was a long time ago when I was a little sapling. Little Groot, you know? <laughs> if the Groot gets blown up, just, you know, I am Groot. I am cross. 
And he was what? Felled from the forest edge. Strong enemy sees me there. Notice, if you're a tree, and somebody pulls you up out of the ground, enemy, <laughs> you want to kill that person. They made me bear their criminals. They bore me on their shoulders, set me on a hill. Enemies enough, fixed me fast. Fast there, firmly. I couldn't move. Okay, he's a, he's a dead freaking log. Of course he can't move. He's a piece of wood, right? Then I saw the Lord of mankind hasten eagerly when he wanted to ascend upon me. I saw the Lord of mankind. Do what? What's the verb he tells us? Hastened. What's the adverb? Eagerly. Why? What does this imply? Notice, is Jesus being dragged to the tree, kicking and screaming? No, he's like, get out of my way, man. I got a date. Destiny. I got a date with the tree, as it were. I'm using that language facetiously because a feminist critic has written about Christ's homoerotic desire with the tree. Because he goes up and embraces the tree. And the tree is described as masculine. And this is something about weird gay sex with the monks or whatever. Just sheer, utter nonsense. That is intentionally being a moron. There's just no other way of putting it. Ugh, that drives me crazy. You got to let the text do what the text wants to do. That is, let the work work. Let a book say what it says. Okay? So, when he wanted to ascend upon me, ascend, rise up, I did not dare to break or bow down against the Lord's word when I saw the ends of the earth tremble. What does that imply? I did not dare to break or bow down. Bingo. The first part of your statement. He didn't want to. The Christ, excuse me, the cross wants to do what? Hell no, not me. I'm not going to be the one to crucify the creator of everything. Pick that tree over there. But... I dare not. Why? Okay. Jesus' will for him? Okay. Think Anglo-Saxon. The tree is speaking as what? The cross is speaking as what? In comparison to Christ, his Lord. Thane. A thane doesn't go against what his Lord says. Duty to one's Lord. First of those fourfold, that fourfold ethic, right? Christ, creator of mankind, creator of everything, is his Lord. He has a duty. So he can't go against it. He doesn't want to be the one to be responsible for the death of his Lord. How do we know this is really what he wants to do? Easily I might have felled all those enemies, yet I stood fast. In other words, I could have taken. I could have done some, I don't know, Yoda Count Dooku jujitsu stuff, you know. And they'd all be dead. We don't, we're not told how. Okay? But I always wish we had been. Because I'm trying to visualize. How could the tree take everybody out? I'm, well, if he's, you know, spanning the horizon, yeah, he just kind of rolls over a few times and everybody's dead. But he's talking now about the cross as a historical thing, okay? Maybe 12 to 15 feet tall, arms 7, 8 feet at most. But I stood fast. Then the young hero notice Christ was a hero <clears throat> did what? Made ready. That was God Almighty. I'm going to talk about why I'm putting these two kind of differing terms up. 
strong and resolute. That's kind of back over on this side. You know, because God isn't weak and wishy-washy. It's not like, oh, well, I think today I'm going to create people and tomorrow I'm going to damn them to hell. And today I'm going to rescue them and tomorrow now I'm going to jam you. What? Why? Why this? He keeps going back and forth between portraying Christ as human, man, and God. Totally God. Right? I think there's a doctrinal purpose at work here. That is, our poet is working on multiple levels. One of those levels, let's say the very, very top surface level, kind of like Tolkien says um, in his foreword to the second edition of Lord of the Rings. He wants to write a tale that's interesting, catches people's you know, imaginations, Anglo-Saxon imagination. So our speaker is trying to keep people's attention, probably working. Okay? The fact that it survives written on a cross and in a manuscript, and those things are separated by about 300 years, means somebody liked it. Okay? So he's got that. Well, what's another level? Well, he's going to start hitting a lot of Germanic ideas. So maybe the speaker re um, is aware that his audience might have some Germanic, let's say, leanings, longings. Uh, can we just go back to our good old pagan ways? Can we stop this, this nonsense dying savior stuff and just kill people? I mean, go take what you want out of life and then die. You know, see what happens. As one side. And the other side, as some of these people might be newly Christian from that pagan Germanic idea. So he's got to gently think what I talked about, St. Gregory telling Augustine, take those pagan sites, baptize them. Take that pagan idea of the Germanic hero and baptize it. Jesify it, literally. <laughs> Turn the pagan hero into Jesus. We'll come back to that. He ascended on the high gallows, brave in the sight of many, when he wanted to ransom mankind. Notice, brave. What does ransom mean? Pay a debt for it. Pay a debt for it. Buy off. Okay? Like in Anglo-Saxon Germanic custom, somebody does something wrong to you or to your family, you can demand, especially if they killed, you can demand wear guild, which literally means man gold, or usually translated, price. Lavandria comes and kills my son. Okay? I could do, sorry, I could do two things. I could demand payment, but she has to pay me. According to Anglo-Saxon law, whatever my status or my son's status is in society, a certain amount. Now, let's say we're churls. We're the lowest of the low. Good for LaWandria. She doesn't have to pay much. Might be a shilling. Might be a pound. But if I'm a king and my son is a prince, you're out of luck. <laughs> and if she can't pay, I could go, okay. You're dead. And I can exact my man price. I'll oh, think Old Testament. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Body for a body. Okay? So when, when that crime happens, and if the person doesn't agree to this, to the first part, the payment, that individual can become Outlaw. See, we think outlaw means what? Bad guy. You've broken the law. Uh-uh. Outlaw, what it really means is you are beyond the boundaries of the law. 
What is the purpose of the law? See, we've gotten this totally screwed up. <laughs> it's protection. It's to protect you. If you outlaw, you're no longer protected by the law. So if James does something, and James doesn't pay the price, I could ask anybody in here, help me. Help me find James. Kill the dirty, rotten SOB. Guess what? James no longer has what? Anybody safe to go to. So when you're outside the law, you got to start living in caves and fens and bad places. You don't want to be an outlaw. <laughs> Worse than exile, because it's exile on steroids. So, he wants to ransom mankind, to buy off mankind. I trembled when he embraced me. There's that line. Christ went up and gave this big erotic, you know, kiss to the cross. <laughs> when he embraced me, but I dared not bow to the ground or fall to the earth's corners. I had to stand fast. I was reared as a cross. That means raised up here in this particular instance. But what does it also imply? Raised like as a child. I, I, my whole purpose in being. Okay. Who's hanging on the cross? Jesus. Christ. Keep going. I heard it. God. Christ is God. Second person of the Trinity. The one through whom, by whom, and in whom, according to St. Paul, all things subsist. In other words, Christ was the creative aspect of the Trinity that created everything. Christ created the tree for what? To kill me. You were created to kill me. So the tree is fulfilling its purpose. I was raised as a cross. Back there in those northern forests. All right? I raised up the mighty king, the Lord of heaven. I dared not lie down. They drove dark nails through me. Okay. Through whom first? <laughs> I'm sure before the cross went, ouch, that hurt. You know, Christ went, mm. <laughs> The scars are still visible. What's the cross mean? Look. Well, where else do we see that? Jesus' hands. In the Gospel of John. About a week after the resurrection, you know, all the apostles have told Thomas, we've seen the Lord. He's like, get out of here. I don't believe you. No, really, we have. And Thomas says, until I see him with my own eyes, put my finger in the print of his hand, put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Another week goes by. They're all sitting together in the upper room. Door is locked and Jesus just appears and taps Thomas on the shoulder. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Put it in. And Thomas replies, my Lord, my God. And Jesus says, blessed are you who have seen and believed. More blessed are those who haven't seen and believed. Read Flannery of Con Connors, A Good Man is Hard to Find. Great, great, you know, little uh, short story in typical... O'Connorian Southern Gothic uh, style, kind of with echoes of that passage. So, scars are still visible. I dare not harm any of them. They mocked us both together. I was all drenched with blood. You know, if you go back to the gospel accounts, how often, where do you hear people going, ha, you stupid cross? <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. It's Jesus that they revile and say, if you're really the son of God, come down, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They don't say, if you're really a good tree, uproot yourself and march back to where you came from. <laughs> I was all drenched with blood flowing from that man's side after he had sent forth his spirit, which is the language used in one of the gospels. He sent his spirit. He said, it is finished. Consummatum est in the Latin. He didn't speak Latin, but, you know, Aramaic. And then the cross says, Much have I endured on that hill of hostile fates. Hostile, enemies' fates. 
I saw the God of hosts cruelly stretched out. How do you stretch out God? Not the Spirit. Is that like, you know, heating up water to make tea, and the steam comes out, and you kind of blow it, and the vapor? Cruelly stretched out. Darkness had covered with its clouds. The rulers, rulers capitalized there, rulers, courts. Oh. Huh. That shining radiance, shadows spread gray under the clouds. Why? Look at the biblical account. The sun went dark. All creation wept, mourned the king's fall. Christ was on the cross. That's the thematic center point of the poem. It's not the literal center point, however. Okay? It's part of the passage that's on the rival cross. So, Christ is on the cross, he's dead, etc. And yet from afar men came hastening to that noble one. I watched it all. I was beset with sorrow, sank into their hands, humbly, eagerly. There they took Almighty God, the A.G., down from the cross and did what? They took Almighty God, lifted him from his heavy torment. The warriors left me, standing drenched in blood. They laid him down, boom, where he stood by his body's head. They watched the Lord of Heaven there who rested a while. Why? So that Dan Brown could write his, you know, novels about Jesus didn't really die. He just mostly died. And then Miracle Max came and gave him a pill so that he could go off cavorting with Mary Magdalene. No. What is meant by he rested a while weary from his mighty battle? This is an example of the old English technique of litotes. It means a severe or accented understatement. So he rested a while weary from his mighty battle. How weary was he? Dead weary. <laughs> Dead tired. Dead tired. Okay. And what do they do? They build a tomb for him. Notice how they build a tomb for him? That's not biblical. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea came. There is a tomb, newly dug. They put him in that. They don't have to build one for him. So that, I think, is an element where the poet is probably thinking, you know, these are a bunch of dumb Germans. They're a bunch of dumb Anglo-Saxons. They can't read. <laughs> I don't have to be, quote, unquote, all biblically, literally accurate here. It's the metaphor. It's the image I'm creating that's really all important. So... They build it in the site of his slayer. Well, that's totally within church tradition. That the tomb was within sight of Golgotha. So the cross is sitting there going, a little deeper. <laughs> they began to sing a dirge for him, wretched at evening. Why? He's dead. Because it's good. Anglo-Saxon Germanic fashion. Your Lord dies. You know, you don't only sing a dirge. You know what else you do? Two, two towers, Peter Jackson version. Aragorn and others, they're making their way to Edoras and they find the burial mounds. And what do we see? He rides in circles around the mound of Beowulf. And we sing the funeral song. We're going to see the same exact thing at the end of Beowulf. Babel's men are going to, sorry to give it away, he dies. <laughs> They're going to sing a funeral dirge. They had to go. They were, they were busy. They, they needed to travel. And so the Lord, well, he rest, rested there with little company. How little? None. That's pretty little. Okay? And we stood there. Who's the we? The cross and... Two other crosses, Christ, and then sinners on the, you know, fight, thieves, robbers on either side, okay? So two other crosses also, 
The corpse grew cold, the fair life house. Then they began to fell us. Who's the they? Enemies of the Lord? We don't know. Followers of the Lord? They dug a deep pit. The Lord's thanes found me there. Who were the Lord's thanes who found the cross? St. Helena. Who is St. Helena? Mother of Constantine. Mother, you guys have a footnote, don't you? Yeah, we do. Mother of Constantine the Great. Okay? She's British. Constantine was British. All right? So, what story is being alluded to there? The finding of the cross. Early 4th century. Okay? Early 300s. According to the tradition of the church, Helena comes to Jerusalem. Uh, if I remember right, she's had a vision, or a vision came to her. And in the vision, she was told to find the true cross. And she's like, okay, I don't know how, but okay. Goes to Jerusalem, asks around, and is told where to dig. They dig, and they find not one, not two, but three crosses. How do they know which one's Jesus? Is it the one that said, Jesus was here, you know, carved by somebody on the bottom? No, they're all stained with blood. Okay, Again, this is 300 years later, nearly 300 years later. So, they decide to speak to the patriarch, the leader of the Christian church in Jerusalem, and he says, here's what we'll do. We'll hold the crosses up, and we'll bring sick people. People with palsy, people with cancer, people with you know various infirmities, and we'll bring them under the shadow of the cross. Those who are healed will know that's the cross of Christ. If they're not healed, then we can get rid of that cross. Okay? Why? Because of the book of Acts, people come under fall under Peter's shadow and they're healed. Or they touch Peter's handkerchief and they're healed, etc. So they hold up the three crosses, and these two do nothing, and this one does something. That's the cross of Christ. It gets covered in gold, pieces get cut off, blah, 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 blah. Okay? Um, and so it gets adorned with gold and silver, and we've got just a few more minutes. Top of 74. Change in tone. Change in rhetoric. Okay? Everything that's happened up until this point, or everything that's been said up until this point, is essentially what? From when the cross begins to speak until this point, what's the cross been doing? Recounting the story. Recounting the story, telling the past. It's all been history. Okay? This is what happened. Look at why 78. Now. Now is when? It's now. It's the present. That was all in the past, but now we're up to the present. Now you can hear, my dear hero. Cross has just done what? Address the dreamer directly. I'm talking to you, whoever you are. Now you can hear, my, dream, my dear hero, that I've endured the work of evildoers, harsh sorrows. Now... The time has come that far and wide they honor me. Who's the they? The evildoers? Yeah, kind of. Sinners. Christians. They honor me, men over the earth, and all this glorious creation, and pray to this sign. That is, prior to Christ being hung on the cross, did anybody wear a cross around their neck? No. It'd be like somebody walking around today wearing an image of an electric chair around their neck, or you know, uh, injection. Well, some people do that, but <laughs> different kind of injection. <laughs> On me, the Son of God suffered for a time. For a time. The suffering has stopped. And so, glorious now, I rise up under the heavens, and I'm able to heal each of those who is in awe of me. Notice, under the heavens. The cross is suggesting something about what he slash it serves as. 
So you have down here, earth, middle earth, the cross, the heavens. What's the cross become? Between the earth and the heavens? It's like a bridge. Like a bridge, a ladder, a way. He's going to use the term a way. I have opened a way. Once I was made into the worst of torments, most hateful to all people, and it really, really was. How do you, how many of you know how crucifixion actually works? How do you actually die? Suffocation. Suffocation. You don't die from blood loss or pain. See, because you take a cross, whatever the height, and when you're getting ready to put it in the ground, Here's the ground. You, you dig a hole three to four feet deep. Okay? You nail the person onto the cross lying down. And then you take the bottom of the cross. To, my elbow is the hole, or is the foot of the cross. You take the bottom of the cross to the hole, and you gradually lift it up until it gets just high enough to where this outside edge, let's say this edge, clears this part, and this part is down like this, to make the hole a little bit smaller, and the cross would be like this. Well, you tip it so that this clears here, and what happens? Boom! And it drops three or four feet. And you're hanging like this. And you're not tied, and you're not standing on something. So what immediately happens? Both shoulders dislocate. And when your shoulders dislocate, your lungs don't work properly. And all you can do is kind of go, well, that can last a long time, several days. But what day was the crucifixion? The eve of Passover. Can't let him stay on the cross overnight. <laughs> Can't. Uh, you got to kill him, which is why they asked Pilate to sin. Right? So that's why it's the most fearsome. Um, before I opened the true way of life for speech bearers. Now, maybe the cross is being a, you know, a little bit egotistical there. You know, I, I opened the way, not the one who you know, died on me. Lo, the king of glory, guardian of heaven's kingdom, we're going to stop here, honored me over all the trees of the forest. And I'm going to stop right there so that when we come back, hopefully you copied all this stuff, <laughs> if you didn't. I'll make sure I go take a picture of it so I can put it back up the other day. Because right there, the poet's going to get start getting very, very doctrinal. And he's going to make allusions to the Nicene Creed. Okay, we will start. We do get out here at 11.05, right? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I always get my times mixed up. So we're a little bit behind.